Good afternoon to you all and uh, welcome to the seminar series of the School of Political Science and International Studies for 2018. For the new faces in the room, a particularly warm welcome to you and a note that I'm not the convener of the seminar series. Uh, Dr Eloise Weber is the series convener but she's asked me to introduce today's seminar because of my close association with our speaker Dr Mary Graham. Though Eloise has reminded me uh, recently how wonderful it is to have Mary present uh, for us because when Eloise took over as the seminar series convener we had a seminar uh, by Mary and it was a packed room and a fantastic discussion so it's really nice to see so many people here today I expect we'll able, be able to reproduce that enjoyable discussion. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Aunty Mary but before I do so I want to note that we're on Aboriginal land and that Aboriginal people are, to borrow some of Mary's idiom, the original owners and runners of this continent. Um, Australian Aboriginal people are probably unequivocally the earliest architects of human order. Um, and it's in that context I acknowledge the traditional owners both locally and across the continent and note that Aboriginal people have never ceded authority to govern in this continent. And the longer this question remains unaddressed in our Australian political debate, the more it seems to intensify. We saw it bubble up very publicly earlier this week on Q&A, the ABC's political discussion program. Um, uh, so I think that's an interesting uh, reflection or interesting event that flows through to some of what Mary's got to talk about today. So. Dr Mary Graham is known to many of us in the school and in fact the wider UQ community for her consistent and remarkable contributions to help build knowledge and understanding about Indigenous settler politics. She lives on her father's country on the Gold Coast and is affili affiliated with Waka Waka people, not so far to the north of here actually through her mother's people. She's worked extensively as a teacher, a researcher, a consultant, and she's been recognised locally and in fact internationally for her work on Indigenous philosophy. Her contributions have been honoured through an honorary doctorate from the Queensland University of Technology in 2016, is that? I think, I think it was 2016, yeah. So one of Mary's collaborations is with Professor Irene Watson, who is the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Indigenous Education at the University of South Australia. And I think uh, Irene and Mary find a very strong connection in a commitment to drawing upon and respecting Indigenous terms of reference in law, politics and philosophy. And it's in that context that uh, Professor Watson led the preparation last year of a First Nations submission from Australian First Nations to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the body of independent experts that monitors, of course, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And toward the end of last year, Mary travelled with Irene to the um, CERD meetings and was part of, part of the proceedings there and interacted with the committee and so on. Part of what is really interesting and important here is that this particular, this First Nations submission breaks with a pattern of earlier submissions to the CERD that have involved uh, Australian Aboriginal people. While previous submissions have very understandably argued for better representation of Indigenous people, attention to Indigenous people's needs, hi Trini, um, attention to Indigenous people's needs, greater funding and so on, these kinds of representations have argued within or predominantly in relation to the terms of rep representation of the architecture and machinery of liberal settler colonial order. This, in contrast, the submission that's led by Irene, uh, Professor Irene Watson, takes an arguably more fundamental step by asserting Indigenous autonomy and law on Indigenous terms in relation to the jurisdiction of international law. In this way, it connects directly with grassroots movements in Australia, and most particularly the recent fairly emphatic refusal of Indigenous people through a grassroots consultation process to be 
uh, incorporated within and recognised in the Australian Constitution through some sort of uh, relatively symbolic recognition as part of constitutional reform. This also, also this kind of refusal is one word to describe this, and this is emerging in other sites around the globe as well. So that's some of the background to today, but there's a bit of a backstory to today's seminar that I want to uh, briefly share with you. Late last year, Mary approached me to see if the school would be t willing to contribute some funds to support Mary to travel to Geneva with Irene. I, in turn, approached our head of school, Associate Professor Richard Devitak, who I'm pleased to say didn't hesitate to agree to provide some funding, um, given the contribution that Mary makes to the school. And upon her return, Mary uh, offered to talk about her experience, and Richard and Eloise and I quickly agreed that that would be a, a good thing to do. So I'm sure you'll agree that we're privileged to have a window to this particular third meeting, the periodic review, Australia's periodic review, and particularly privileged to have Mary's thoughts on the proceedings. It's not a formal academic mm -hmm. seminar today. We're doing something different to open up the series. Mary's going to provide us with some informal reflections and observations and then in, move into, into some form of conversation or, or discussion. Certainly, I think she'll, she'll take any particular questions that, that you have, but the hope is that we might have more of an informal conversation uh, than the usual Q&A. So that's it from me for now. <laughs> and I promise I won't, uh, you won't hear too much more from me from, for today. But uh, please join me in welcoming Mary. Thank you very much. And um, before I actually start, I was wondering, do you want to make a, an announcement about any kind of reproductive kind of happenings? Oh. <laughs> well, the, the, I have some, I have some oh, personal okay. things going on. It's good to see we're keeping the informal <laughs> character. <laughs> To the, to the seminar <laughs> happening, but uh, for, for those who don't know, my partner and I are expecting a child. It was due a couple of days ago. It hasn't come yet, though I should it's keep an eye on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, no announcements yet. But if I do have to go, yeah, Eloise will agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to see you. See you Ren. Thanks. Okay. Um, so. First thing is I'll uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the, this whole the region in Brisbane, the Terrible on the north side and the Yagara, Jagra on the south side. Um, but also, um, just to, before starting, to say thank you formally, you know, to the department and to yourselves, you know, for helping us to get over there because um, I must say, uh, young Trudy here, uh, Broderick, she came with us, she's a lawyer, non-practicing lawyer, but she was one of our little team. But that was um, really helpful because um, Indigenous people have always had to raise the funds, you see. Go around asking, asking, you know, because no, um, governments don't help you to get over there because, you know, um, it was very interesting, the whole thing. And Trudy, I think she got some photos which you might share. They've already set it up with her, oh, if you okay. want to. Photos, of, but not. Uh, it's not speaking, is it? It's, it's photos and filming. And I think I do have a bit of video of you talking to the oh. um, federation. Oh, right. The Common Games Federation. Oh, right. Okay. But oh. not for CERD. Oh yeah, yeah, not for CERD. Yeah, actually, yeah. Because I was invited while I was there. But uh, before that, I was invited over to this IOC um, um, global events, sporting, sporting events. events. Uh, because I'm involved with the Commonwealth Games, mm -hmm. the elders group, and, and, there too. and they were very helpful too, actually, to help us get over there. So, yeah, so you, were, you came to that too. And, yeah. and I, uh, it's unbelievable, I was only on there for about like 10 minutes or something, yeah. out of the whole, whole <laughs> days, all the days, you know, but I was just there for a little while. Anyway. <coughs> Perhaps when we turn to discussion, mm -hmm. Trudy, you can liaise with Eloise yes. and put some images up yeah. after, yeah. after an initial um, yeah. few words from Mary. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't intending to talk in a formal kind of way about it. You explained it, Morgan explained the whole thing just really, really well. And, of course, it's a 40-page document. I, I don't know if people have actually read it, read all of it or read some of it. Um, it's really, it's brilliant. I've been sending it around to everybody. Um, a whole lot of people like it, a lot of blackfellas like it. I'll use that term if you don't mind, blackfellas and whitefellas. 
Um, we all always use it. Um, so, um, so I guess the the main thing, um, the the theme running through the whole paper, and and also there's the um, third uh, observations or responses to that's very interesting actually, um, is the basis basic thing of that she says, which is quite true, is that terra nullius is alive and well in this country. It has never gone away. It's been, in a sense, masked, I suppose. <laughs> it wears different hats and different um, costumes and so on and so on. But basically, it's still very, very much in, in, um, in power. And uh, the question that she asks is, uh, which is the, the fundamental question about our relationships, um, between a Aboriginal people and, uh, and the whole country, is by what lawful authority did um, Britain, uh, you know, another country, come and take over our our land, basically? By what lawful authority? You know. Um, so, as she says, there has never been an answer to that question uh, at all from the Australian state, not for two hundred and so years, so many years. And um, so that's what she answers, in a sense, from how, how that question has been answered, uh, or not, uh, non-answered, not answered, um, by the Australian state in their relationship with, with, with us over, the, over time. And it's a, it's a strange thing. It's, um, we talk about it often, about um, what kind of a country Australia is. It's a strange mixture of... Um, ultra modern, of course, ultra modern, technological, democratic, you know, complex society, Western society. But in some regards, it's actually a very old fashioned country, actually. <laughs> a very old fashioned country. It's, uh, you know, it's still somewhere back uh, about 100 years ago in its relationship with the indigenous people. Um, so the idea that someone can invade, invade, come in and take over somebody else's land which has always been a kind of a shock to Aboriginal people that from our, our point of view of what law is, um, the regulation of you know, social and political order, the actual regulation, says that you, you simply can't invade somebody else's country. You can have big fights with them, but you can't invade, uh, actually. You can't take over someone else's. And that's, that was the law, basically, right across the whole country, a huge continent, um, and among every one of the groups. So it's not written down, it's an understood thing. And, and, and another, another a side argument is whether that evolved or whether it developed. And because of our, you know, the great age, social, like society's age of our, of our mob, mobs, um, I suppose you could say it, it, it evolved like that, I suppose, I guess you could. So here is this system, a lawful, a lawful system, it's, it's, it is a true system because it's lateral and, and it's ver you know it's vertical so it goes into the country. Um, it's complex and it's, effi it's efficient. It's efficient for having order, for having an ordered society, uh, ordered relations between each other. So invading wasn't a, you know it just simply didn't exist. So a whole lot of regions across the world have this idea that it is normal. And I'm not even saying it's wrong. Uh, I'm just saying it is normal for a whole lot of other parts of the world. If you've had nothing but invasion for 10,000 years, of course it's, it's normal, isn't it? It's a logic, you know, and so on and so on. But here was one place that, that it didn't, didn't happen like that. So um, a bit like white swans and black swans, you know, that argument, that logic argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, they didn't know there was black swans only until they came here. Um, so it's always a different, interesting, new thing to, to learn. And her paper is really about our relationship with this, with our, ourselves, our other mobs around the country, the rules. She talks about her own mob, and we all sort of talked about, uh, myself, Trudy, Leslie Clements was the other uh, lady. Um, so we all talked about our own mobs in our own perspective areas and so on, told our stories and so on. Not so much in the talk, but amongst, um, there was informal gatherings with the third committee 
in other parts. We had a church to sit in and have coffee and talk and talk and so on. And they were uh, on board in the meetings. They were incredibly um, supportive. But of course, you could see uh, probably from um, the uh, that they have to their actual report is held to a formal kind of. It's all very uh, how do you put it conservative. The language is diplomatic. diplomatic so yeah, that's a diplomatic language. Eh? So it's not a rah rah kind of obviously. It's the third committee's sort of observations. But in in action, in talking in the actual um, uh, big gathering with the Australian government there, uh, that was really interesting. They had a huge delegation, uh, and the um, the ambassador, I can't think of his name, the ambassador to the UN from Australia. I think he didn't really care for our our approach, especially saying that Terra Nullius is still in power. Mm-hmm. He, he vehemently didn't, you know, oppose that and mm-hmm. was quite angry, uh, quite really angry, at upping the table and things oh, like that. Oh, really? Oh, yes, yeah, very angry. Um, and at, w- at one point there, he was, you know, up on the podium, sort of with the chair of the sir, and he was leaning forward with his head in his hands like because <laughs> I think the whole business is driving me crazy you know because of some of the things that were <laughs> coming out uh, uh, but but also because of the questions that the third committee was asking were asking him you know and so on so um, and they were they were just really good um, we we presented ourselves as first nations people there are other Aboriginal people there who had been going for a long time and they're an NGO, and I, I know them, and I'm on that um, part of that organisation too, for years and years. Um, but we thought of ourselves, and you know, as, as she put it, we we are not an NGO. We're not we're not part of this, like you say, architecture. It's Western architecture. Do you know what I mean? As and slotted in, as well. These are the people with the grievance, and this is our grievance, and this is who we are, and we're this is our title according to the titles of all the other agreed <coughs> parties around the world. You know. So we're, we're in this room. You know. So we didn't approach it like that at all. We said we are the First Nations people. We are the owners and runners of the place. Um, and that term, oh yes, we're, we're owned by the country. You know, um, It's a bit sort of weak. I mean, it's true, but it's weak. It, and it's not quite the truth, um, because it sounds non-threatening. And sounds like makes Aboriginal people sound uh, lovely people, um, <laughs> not threatening, you know. Um, and also a little bit like childlike, I suppose. But um, when you know even a little bit about what Aboriginal law is about, and she is, she really is an expert at it. Um, it's it's anything but we can, you know, uh, trying to show ourselves to be this. Um, gentle kind of mob that you know is never um, you know well invaded and doesn't have wars and so on and so on so so uh, and how strong it is and how long it's been strong for and how it's embedded in us um, the law itself just like the land you know genetically embedded if if there can be such a, a system like a where the land itself is embedded in us you know genetically well in a sense the law is genetically embedded in us too. So it's like it's like that term assumed knowledge, do you know? You know, we just assume it's um, the answer or the response from Justice Gray in the Northern Territory talking about things like um, the problems of the future problems of Australian law. Um, the whole thing with Aboriginal affairs, Aboriginal people is that it'll be a big problem in the future for Australian law because Aboriginal people still imagine they own the country. You know, that's quite right, actually. <laughs> that it's, it's gonna, and it is a problem. It's going to be always a problem because, because it's not ideological. It's not an idea that's ideological. We don't think of it in political, ideological terms that the country's ours and we will fight back and, you know, and so on and so on. It's just a fact of life, actually. And it's something that Australian governments, sooner or later, for their own good, basically, and for the good of the whole country, actually, to modernise the country, you know, they have to come to terms with it somehow or other. So, in other words, like treating 3% of the people as equals to 97% of the people. That's what it really entails, you know. Um, and she says, basically, all, all of this, 
So we're First Nations people. The essential thing is that terra nullius is still in place. They try to hide it, Australian governments, excessive ones, even the best of them. Um, like, like the Fraser government, uh, I know it sounds strange, the Liberal government, they did more for Aboriginal people. Do you know that? Uh, everybody, I think uh, people know that. Um, than uh, Labour parties have ever done, uh, for all the apologies. And as she says here, I think um, apologies more or less means, you know, talk is cheap, basically. Um, it, didn't, it didn't bring about any kind of, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, what do you call it? Um, a change of policy about how we're treated, do you know? Um, it didn't mean anything, and these are some of the things that they brought up, is that um, here we are, 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2000, you know, in the 2000s, um, not quite 300 years later, and we, we're the only ones who haven't got any kind of treaty. You know, the only English-speaking common law country in the world that doesn't have any kind of agreement with the Indigenous people. We don't have any independent economic um, uh, situation, you know, um, system, let alone a voice. No independent structure, like, like a formal structure, like a Congress. There's a National Congress at the moment, but it's been cut off at the knees because Australia, Australian governments haven't, haven't um, they cannot, um, for some reason, they, I think they find it very, very difficult to um, accept that we should and ought to have our own voice. Um, so no independent policy making at all, none, none at all. Only governments make, and they have Aboriginal people working in government. You know. um, the idea of having a, an advisory uh, group, an advi which is always, I, I always maintain, is like a paper tiger, advisory groups, you know, no formality, it's all informal, and hand-picked, hand-picked, hand, you know, chosen by government to be a, a give advice to them, and so on and so on. Um, so very much within the Western framework, Australian Western framework. Um, so none of those things here in 2018 are still here. And they brought all of that up. And of course, as you know, uh, uh, spending money is extremely important um, in Aboriginal affairs. Um, so billions of dollars get spent. And he brought all of that up, the, um, the, um, along with all the statistics about how much money is spent on Aboriginal affairs and Aboriginal people and so on. Billions, literally billions of dollars, you know, every year. Um, and a very small percentage, in actual fact, gets to Aboriginal communities, which is why a lot of people are still living in third world situations in this very rich country. You know. But they were, they were very good. Uh, they brought it up in that way. Um, you know, they're, um, ha how is it? Uh, because that's what he launched. We've done this. We have these programs, $20 million, a whole listing thing. And they were very well aware of this kind of, they must have heard these arguments before, I think. Um, is that you? It's as, this is the smoke screen. This is what we have done for the Aboriginal people. See, this is how much. <laughs> but not one bit of it is controlled or managed or run by Aboriginal people. Not one bit of it. Nothing. So you are completely always, as she says, in different ways, giving examples everywhere um, of how um, how we are always made accountable. But states are never made accountable, really. Uh, and the, who, who holds the federal government to, to account eh, about where, what happens to all this money uh, and the success or failures of it and, and so on and so on. Um, so it, it just goes on and on and on. You know? um, and it all does come back to terra nullius. Um, that's the, the big question is, what, what do you do about it? The the um, another um, how could you put it in a costume um, a pretense choreographed kind of play called Native Title you know um, pretending to recognise us you know pretending that oh yes this is a seminal moment you know turning the turning a, what do you call it, a milestone and all that kind of stuff but um, that's very well taken care of by the Australian government you know, very well taken care of, as she, she puts it in different ways. I'm not, sorry, I won't, I won't go over it because it's... Um, um, but if you've read it, you, you'll see all these various case studies that she puts forward. Um, um, a 
fail, failures to complete utter failures to consult with Aboriginal peoples um, in, in right across the country about a whole range of things, what happens in their area, um, all to do with the environment, to do with mining, uh, to do with development, economic development, and so on. And you you only you only have your own voice of your own people ever to argue back. You know you don't have any formal standing. You don't have any. And while while our lot have different ideas about treaties too, you know they're not all clones of each other. Um, we we see that it's it is a kind of a, a legal instrument that you could use. It's the equivalent of Instead of having both hands behind your back, you have one hand tied behind your back <laughs> and you have a hand free. And that treaty, whatever it is, those old treaties, which were always quite often broken by white men, of course, white people, um, in those other uh, places, uh, Canada, America and so on, um, um, that's what we see. It's a chance to do it. It's the only chance. You know, even those people who previously were against treaties, they, they now are for it. And especially, uh, an so, sorry, Australian governments have a, they can only, the Australian government can only blame itself because it was such a, a ball faced, um, what do you call it? Um, ham fisted way of um, <laughs> trying to uh, force people to go with the sovereignty, you know, the recognition, the whole recognition. That, that this is why people rejected it out of hand, a lot of Aboriginal people. They don't want to be part of some symbolic thing, as you're saying, you know, in, in this in that framework. Um, we are our own people. Um, we'll stand and be uh, responsible for our own status. We will determine what our status is, you know. We, we not only are owed that, um, we, we would declare that that's, that's quite right, the proper the proper thing to do for a lawful, a lawful people and a lawful system in their own country over such vast periods of time, you know, they've got nothing to prove, you know, nothing to, uh, nothing excuses and so on. Um, so um, I guess I guess I just want to leave it in an open-ended sort of way. Um, and if people have read any part of it, or if you're very interested in any particular part of it. Um, Please look, just bring it up. And by all means, challenges too. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, okay with that. <laughs> Mary, oh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Trudy, uh, 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 yeah, sorry, if you want to say anything further. Do you want to, uh, um, that anything that, po Trudy, uh, you introduce yourself. Sorry, sorry. Yes. I had the privilege of tagging alongside Annie Mary and learning a lot from her and um, Dr. Watson absolutely learned a lot from her and um, I think the position paper um, really sort of spelled out what we see a lot, certainly in Queensland at the moment as well mm. with the Carmody report and the review of the Child Protection Act and if you, uh, I think part of her argument is if you look at um, native title law, it really, it really is sort of just a, a, a mm kind of like the sidekick to, to colonisation because when you look at what it does, it sort of says that you need to have maintained a connection with the land in order to assert your rights as an Indigenous person in relation to Native title law. But if you keep taking our kids away, it doesn't really make sense to do that. And I think um, after I read an article recently about uh, sort of like someone made the comment that why would you remove, like why would you take poverty as a reason for removing children mm. so a, a parent or parents unable to provide the basic necessities as a, through no fault of their own, through poverty, and then pay another family, a non-Indigenous family, double the money to look after that child. Wouldn't you just put the resources where they belonged mm. in the first place? Mm. So it makes sort of sense. And when you think about the article that Dr. Watson has sort of written and you know, our position at the UN, it, it really does sort of support that argument. I mean, really, colonisation pulled a corker. It really did. Mm. And by its very nature, it's, it's, it's quite abusive. Mm. So, yeah. That's right. Trudy, uh, is... Um, you're a non-practicing lawyer. Non-practicing, so no, I've, done, yeah, yeah. So I've done, done. I've done my time at You've done your time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, yes. so I definitely have an interest in this area, but more more in discrimination. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
So we'll open up for some questions in a, in a, in yes, a minute. Yes. I thought I might just say, say something. Mary yes. said the, yes. the committee was well disposed to the arguments that were made um, in their submission. There were other parallel submissions by Indigenous people, including yes. at least one other that was very strongly critical of the native title regime. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, as Mary said, the language of the committee is very diplomatic and so on. But this, what I have before me, is the un advanced, unedited version of the observations of the committee of, on um, the 18th to 20th periodic reports on Australia. And despite the uh, diplomatic language, there's very, it's actually really strong language and quite strong points. For example, the committee calls upon the state party to urgently introduce a paradigm shift in its dealing with Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and to demonstrate the necessary political will to ensure that aspirational plans and programs become a reality. The committee, while taking note of the information provided by the delegation on the difficulties associated with carrying out constitutional referendum, regrets that despite long-standing demands by Indigenous people, their legal status is still not enshrined in the Constitution. The committee recommends that the state party accelerate its efforts to implement Indigenous people's self-determination demands, as set out in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, etc., etc. The committee is concerned that after centuri centuries of conflict and negotiations over their traditional land rights, the claims of Indigenous peoples to land remain unresolved, and so on and so on, in that vein. So, diplomatic language, but actually really quite forceful. Um, and of course, None of this is necessarily binding, but Australia is a signatory. Australia is committed to continue to go through these iterations of the uh, periodic review and so on and respond to these uh, uh, documents and um, responses of the, of the committee. Yeah. They have to go back later in the year, apparently. Yes. I don't yeah. know when that is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we'll sort of like report back on this, yeah. what has been done so far. Yeah. So I think let's let's maybe open it up to yeah, yeah. questions for for Mary and perhaps Trudy as well, if you'd like, and uh, and have that flow into whatever sort of discussion emerges. Shah, yeah. I was just wondering about uh, going to these international fora like. Uh, CID, um, where do you see that within the broader picture of your struggle to achieve the objectives you're after? Because as uh, Morgan was saying, it is really binding, and Australia has been actually quite good, not just Australia, at getting around a variety of international obligations uh, quite quite easily, really. Uh, refugees yes. number one, yes. uh, refugee convention. Mm, that's um, so, where, where do you see that? What mm. what do you hope to achieve by engaging in these? Uh, well, in these I think. Forums? As Irene has said, we just have to be there, be out there, but not not rely on it. Don't have too high our hopes, but you have because for a lot her and other people too have disregarded it. You see, where uh, the other couple of delegation NGOs have always gone over to the UN every year, you know, or every couple of years or so, regularly for like decades. So we're always very kind of like that about it, you know. But we thought, well. You just have to be there, really, and to put down, but also to keep that same, reiterate this message about terra nullius. So you can, um, I think the idea was that we can go over there and argue, um, and we do, and it's true, um, that we get treated horribly, you know. Um, every attempt at having a, a, a formal representative body has been cut off at the knees, basically, just on a whim, just swept away, John Howard, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and continually contradict themselves, Australian governments, you know, it all, and it all depends on who's in power and um, the movers and shakers, the interests and all that kind of stuff to do with mining and, and media and stuff. Um, and the treatment, the native title, complaints. So it's like a complaints bureau, and but recognise that too. But also just have one on mark message all the time about Terra Nullius. And that for all its Western, you know, um, self praise really about um, our good Western law is and the rule of law and international law. But all the, you know, 
all the um, not very good things about it are plain for all to see. You know? So all we really have to do is just keep doing that one, it's like a beat, you know? Just say it again and again. You can go into the re all the, how it's played out, how we're treated very badly. Like at the moment there's, uh, in the media, there's something about, um, you said that about a toddler having been raped by someone in one of those communities. Yeah, now I'm not, not obviously not making an excuse about that, but the media plays its role very well, very well in this country. Every time something is coming to a head where decisions have to be made and policies or something like that, something to do with, um, well, what, they, what are they going to do about uh, the recognition thing and so on and so on. They will, put, they will bring out, and it can't be an accident, they will always bring out something about the terrible dysfunctional state, state, state of different communities around the country. <coughs> and always with the idea that, well, you see these people, they can't run their own affairs. Yeah. They've got all these, you know, criminal types and so on. That's the message. That's the real message. Not the message that this bloke is, uh, is a mongrel and has to be arrested and put away and blah, 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 you know, and so on. Um, but they'll just single out something like that. And you know it's being choreographed. And we all know. Aboriginal people do too. Because it happens regularly, you know. Uh, and that's the kind of media that there is. And the closeness between the media and the government on particular things to do, like asylum seekers stuff, um, uh, you know, and of course Aboriginal affairs and so on and so on. So, so I think we agree on this, you know, you know, we all agree, with Irene and a couple other people think in those ways too. Yes, we'll keep complaining about particular things, yes, it's pretty bad, torture, torture and murder in um, um, prisons by Aboriginal people, you know, it is straight out torture. Hasn't been called torture, no? um, but uh, but we'll 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 stick to that one line. It's a mark. It's it explains everything, you know, in a way. Terra nullius. This is why people are still being treated like this because terra nullius is the strongest thing in this country. It hasn't changed. We'll see the end to those things when terra nullius is kind of, if possible, really done away with and fixed up. For so you know what I mean? It's that kind of that kind of thinking, I suppose. Can I, if, can I add a, a yeah, little yeah, bit that, including through some of my conversations with with Professor Irene Watson about this, I think there's a combination of Aboriginal people playing a very very long game. In part, people would say because this comes to them naturally because they are ancient people, but also because they're playing in conditions of extreme asymmetry. Mm. as very disadvantaged mm. populations. Mm. Mm. And in that setting, um, one of the things that needs to be done in, I think, in, in Irene's and, and Mary's view, correct mm. me if I'm wrong, yeah. is to work at slowly changing mm. the conversation, the discourse, mm. if you like, around these matters. And um, I was speaking about Irene to, to Irene about this, and in a way, this kind of document is almost trying to pitch out a couple of decades, a couple of decades into the debate and discussion and put a, a marker in and say, this is a reference point, uh, an anchoring point for where we need to go. And of course it can seem hopeless in conditions of gross asymmetry to be engaged in that kind of practice, but I don't think the empirics bear that out because, I mean, even quite recently we have locally here a Member of Parliament, like Jackie Trad, uttering the word treaty. Go back yes. 20, 20 years, um, there would be that that might have been talked about in radical circles or pushed mm. from the, the 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 limits of mainstream political debate. But this is now happening. There is discussion about this. I think there are, we need to be a little bit cautious about this too. South Australia and Victoria are in the process yes. of negotiating treaties, but an important corrective on this is of course they're not treaties because that it's only the federal yeah. government that has the authority at international law to negotiate treaties. So they're agreements of some sort, mm -hmm. but nonetheless they're significant movements. So I think the point is when you're playing a very long game, if you keep this beat yes. going, that we are yes. owners and runners of country, yes. we deserve to be interlocutors mm -hmm. in conversations about governance in this continent, then eventually, hopefully you can get Somewhere, um, we we had someone else. Sorry, I don't know your name, and, and then let's come to Sally. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Mary. This is the second time that I've heard you speak, mm -hmm. 
and I, I find it fascinating because, as you can tell from my accent, I'm, yes. I'm not from around here. You're not from around here. And so and I... You call me Mary, yeah? Please. Okay. Um, but I think all these, these forums oh, no. that not where me. I last met you was the International Philosophy Day last year, oh, and yes, that was yes. really fascinating. And, but the more events that you go to, like this educating people, and um, mm. I saw your, I don't know what you call him, your colleague, but the, the um, uh, fellow who's very knowledgeable about astronomy speak at the World Science Festival. Yes. And the uh, no, uh, indigenous mean. woman who's a physicist. Anyway, okay. any kind of educational form is super helpful. You, you said something in your talk that 300 years later, Australia is the only, if I understood you correctly, Commonwealth country that hasn't negotiated some type of treaty with its mm. indigenous people? Common law, I, common law country, oh. yes. Um, is there country. an example of any country that has Pretty done sure. it, in your opinion, well, that could be used as any form of a framework? Do you look at she would answer that better. But do you have any ideas about that? I no, but I, I can't I think of any. <laughs> well, uh, well, it, the, the the New Zealand the Waitangi mm. treaty is always held up as you know they got what they want, but they're still arguing about mm. how it was done. And all that, you know, there's still an argument there, but um, it's it, it can't be just looked at as a as a treaty. The kind of people are all different, you know, obviously, yeah. yeah. And um, so I don't know if anything's been done well. A lot of the American ones, if I'm not mistaken, and the Canadian ones, I think, are old treaties. Yeah. So there were old treaties that got, you know, ignored or chucked out or something, and then retrieved or revived, yes. yeah. you know. And that Very was pretty. good. They could take that to court, you know. So it's the process, I suppose. It's not the actual mm. thing of the treaty, mm. but but also they they they'd had to be uh, re uh, what do you call it re um, talked about uh, renegotiated renegotiated. Yes, that's right, um, because things have changed so much. Yeah. And and land is uh, wrecked in some places, which was looked after always by the indigenous people. You know, so. Right. so I can't, I can't, um, no, I can't sort of point to any particular one. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, Mary, I wonder if you could say something about whether and poss or possibly how you think that universities, as powerful organisations, not individual academics, mm -hmm. but universities might help to advance the treaty mm -hmm. specifically or indigenous rights mm -hmm. generally. So I'm not talking about the, mm -hmm. the researchers, I'm talking oh, about yes, powerful, powerful organisations mm -hmm. of universities. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, um, I think universities are all are in a place, place with a capital P kind of thing. So I, I guess... Um, in, in different ways, um, they have to kind of establish a, a relationship in a way with the, who, whoever the local group or groups or region group, regional groups are, do you know, to really start a long conversation, a very long conversation, um, because they always did have um, agreements, Aboriginal people, so they made agreements, they had diplomatic traditions with their neighbours and so on, and it wasn't always peaceful, but you know, they had some kind of arrangement. But they got to know each other, and and if they didn't get on, they had um, like traditional enemies, and that's not a bad thing having a traditional enemy. If you're going to have an enemy, that's the best <laughs> one to have. <laughs> a traditional enemy, because you know each other very well. So, so a relationship between a big institution and the local indigenous mob would have to start off like that, um, almost like it's a physical. What do you call it? A construction job on a building. <laughs> a construction job of establishing really good relations, diplomatic relations. You would have to start off like that. And um, then then the whole thing about what would be in those what would be in this treaty. Even the form of a treaty, you know. Um, what is a treaty, you know? Um, uh, I don't think I'm giving anything away too much, but we're <laughs> uh, Southern Cross. Mm -hmm. They're um, d from uh, in New South Wales, northern New South Wales, basically, talking about starting an Aboriginal university. I think part, not separate, I think, but... And we were talking about it, um, and we were talking about starting off, we all had a different say, and one of the things I was asking was, well, what is the purpose of us? What is the purpose of a university? Ask mm. a really, really basic question. Mm. You know, because we know old European universities, they go back a thousand years or something like that. You know, Paris, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, so, so what did they start out to be? Do you know what I mean? 
Um, we, we never had things like that. We're you know, small societies, learning is the whole communities, you know, and so on. Uh, and there's a structure of, of sorts, a, a, a soft hierarchy of knowledgeable older people and so on, and knowledgeable skilled people in different work areas. But a, but a university is where the learning is all brought together for kinds of purposes and so on. So we would have to talk, that's the kind of things that we would have to talk about. Not, not a fast fix thing, do you know what I mean? You know, not a fast fix. Like, like looking at all the treaties that have been done <laughs> in other countries, English-speaking common law countries and so on. Ah, yes, this is what they've got. So will we, com you know, don't go into the, that sort of thing straight off. Establish what the relationship is going to be. What, what will it be and what, is, what really is the purpose? And I know a lot of people, including especially university people, have probably wondered that. What's the purpose of a university <laughs> for the last couple of decades? You know, is it a fact? Is it a place of learning or is it a factory? <laughs> yeah, churning out, churning out people and you know, and so on and so on. So we'd have to start like that. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Anna Mary. It's always very humbling and illuminating to hear you speak on these matters. I just wanted to ask about the word treaty, but also ask about the word macarata. Oh yes, 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 yes. It, it's a word that was new to me, and yes, yes. really came, yeah. I guess, out of the Uluru well, statement from the heart. And mm, mm. Around that period, yes. I started to hear that word being used, yes. mm. and I'm not too sure if I've got it yes, right, but I think it means a kind of discussion or dialogue, negotiation. Yes, and I wondered what. Towards the is yeah, and and, and, it, and so I guess my question mm. really is, what's the relationship? Well, firstly, what, what exactly yes. does it mean, Macarata, yes, yes. and what's the relationship between that word and treaty? Because obviously, mm. treaty is a very powerful political word, yes. and by sort of historical convention, it's, mm. it's a diplomatic agreement that takes place between two independent sovereign nations. Independent so I understand yes. precisely why yes. this is the word that, uh, That's right, that yeah. you want to use, yes. but then it creates... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if problems, but it certainly creates a challenge yeah. for everyone on, both, on all oh, sides yes. of the discussion yes. about, well, what might the kind of end point look like? Where yes. might this Makarata and then potentially a treaty lead? Mm -hmm. Will it remain the case that these, the yes. two nations are independent and separate, or mm -hmm. is there a possibility that it will become something quite mm -hmm. unique, mm -hmm. a treaty that's about unifying? Unifying. Oh, no, I don't know yes, yes. what your thoughts See, are, and yes. I'd certainly like yeah, to yeah. hear what you and Trudy and others are thinking about those kind of key words, because I think yes, they're really powerful. They are, yeah. The, the only thing I'd start off with is, first of all, the language thing. Mm -hmm. That's their, la their, their language is still pretty well intact in where that whole thing grew up about a Makarata. Um, came out. Um, e everywhere else, um, people are speaking, um, you know, it's English mainly, and it's so they use English terms like treaty and so on. Plus, it's been around for quite a while. Plus, we've been influenced and know about American, American, Canadian, New Zealand mobs with their treaties and so on. Different kind of peoples, two different kind of peoples. Do you know what I mean? All, all together. Um, so they had uh, wars, if I'm not mistaken, you know, in the New Zealand, well, the real full-on big wars, yeah. you know, and so on. And, and of course the American ones too, you know, wars and so on, and battles. So it had to be brought to, so battling groups brought both sides, you know, to a kind of treaty stage across the table, working it out and so on and so on. Um, so it is, it is a bit difficult in our, our way of ordering things. Um, because you, you probably wouldn't have a, um, a treaty after sort of battles, you see. You, you'd, you'd have this relationship. Um, and as I said, you know, you'd, you'd work out what your, what do you call it, rules of engagement? Rules of engagement, things like that. Um, so you wouldn't see, try and see into the future about what, where will it end? You know, what, what, what are we aiming for? You, you just work on the here and now, basically. But especially, you, you have to have your own law. You have to have your own idea of law, of lawful behaviour in your own area. And that's the thing that's very always hard to, for me to understand about Western law. Mm. Um, 
um, you know, we, we, can, we can point to all Aboriginal people, regardless of the language and place and so on, we can all point to the underlying principle of the, the land is the source of the law. Um, I'll just give you an example down home where uh, Commonwealth Games is going ahead. Lots of Aboriginal people have different ideas about it. Unfortunately, there's a group from another area, completely other area, not the coast, nowhere near in our region, who are vehemently against it. <laughs> and, uh, and they came and visited us. This is an um, elders group, elders um, committee. And we all said, yeah, no, yeah, by all means, have the protest. We'll be the last people against the protest. Uh, but there were a few conditions, little and very, very basic conditions, like no flag burning <laughs> for a start, because it's very provocative. Um, yelling and shouting and marching and, and all that is quite OK, and so on and so on, but don't be damaging anything, and so on and so on. Um, anyway, they turned around and did a very, very um, unfortunate thing and started running us down. Us, we just gave them permission to have the, <laughs> have the protest there. Um, and they turned around and raving on about how we've, we've uh, thrown in the towel or given up or cowards or whatever. Uh, it's all on Facebook, mind you. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, about even having the Commonwealth Games. I mean, apart from the logical thing of how would you stop it, how would we stop it, all 300 or fi 500 of our mob? You know, there's, <laughs> one, there's under 1,000 anyway, and there's about five or 6,000 Aboriginal people who live who are historical people on the coast there, you know. So besides, besides that, uh, in Aboriginal terms, they've behaved very badly. Um, it's a culture, it's a cultivated thing. You have to cultivate relationships mm -hmm. besides strictly um, constructing them like a construction job. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now they've behaved badly in that sense. Eh? Uh, anyway, we were talking about it quite angry. So we got together and we talked about um, making a declaration. So they got me to write something about the Yugambe law framework and its rules of conduct, basically. And so it's rules about, uh, we're declaring it, see? not in this great big, you know, the Western legal system and challenging the Western law and that, that sort of thing. But it's about how do you behave lawfully uh, all the time, let alone in somebody else's country. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? That's a thinking, see, it's a particular way of thinking. Can you imagine that's that's the kind of thing that stops you from invading somebody else's country, actually. So it's a it's a broad world, you know, a whole continent wide thing. And everybody understands it though. That's why we all uh, do um, acknowledgements of countries, see it's um, you know, the autonomy. I'm an autonomous being, you're an autonomous being or group, uh, and but my autonomy mustn't transgress your autonomy. Yeah. yeah, nothing like that, so it mustn't happen. Territorial integrity, that's what it's about. They've just gone against that so, mm. by their behaviour and ill, bad manners. Mm. So we do this declaration, and it's the rules, um, and it's a whole number of rules that we're going to be working on, but this is particular rules for behaviour, of uh, for gatherings, celebrations, ceremonies, so on and so on. And there's a whole list of things of how to, how to behave. So we don't, nobody's calling them names or anything like that. Uh, and, and there's not any going to be any kind of bad punishment or, you know, a flogging or something like that, <laughs> a beating, you know, which is quite often, a, that is a one. Um, but the main thing is that they've just, um, in a sense, signed their own death warrant. Uh, when I say death, I mean as far as their reputation goes. Mm -hmm. They will be known from then on as very unlawful people mm -hmm. by everybody else. You know, that's not very good for an Aboriginal reputation, Aboriginal group's reputation, see? Do you know what I mean? And uh, everybody will, all other Aboriginal people, even if they do agree with them about how horrible the Commonwealth Games is, they will not go against that, because that's crossing the line, you see? You're crossing the line by, you know, criticising and <coughs> behaving badly. It's behaving badly in someone else's country. You can't do it. You can't talk like that, you can't act like that, and so on. So, the whole thing is about how we, de what we, de how we declare ourselves. What status do we give ourselves? We declare ourselves to be this people. We are the people of the land of the five rivers. You know, you can bet, see, five rivers. Um, we've been there for so long. We act like this. We make these rules about behaviour uh, that are for you can bear people. That's a big language group. You can bear. Um, uh, for Yugambeh people and non-Yugambeh people, for Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people, 
And the oddest thing about it is that the police are very happy about it. Because <laughs> 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 I think it's a new thing for them, very new thing, to have this kind of rules of engagement laid out like that. You will behave like this, you'll behave like that, you won't behave like this, and so on and so on. All that sort of stuff. See, but that's the background to having treaties, though, too. So we would have to see that, or we would see it, we know it, but we'd see it in the, any kind of agreement or not, or whatever, whatever, whatever it's called. See, it might be, we might come up with a different name altogether, you know, a Yukonbe word. There's a lot of the language of Yukonbe is still pretty good, you know. Um, and we would do the same. So we would start from that, um, in balance, equal, equal partners. All 3% of us against one, no, it's <laughs> just funny, you know. It's crazy, isn't it? But, but that's the system that was across the whole continent. And that's why it is a, a complex, integrated, efficient system. And that's all, of all this long time that blackfellas have been alive, that is the most that human groups can hope for. Forget about love and happiness. <laughs> all you need is, like, you've got to aim for an efficient one where people are included. It's an inclusive system. Uh, where people have, above all, have confidence in their system. Mm. I don't think that's, that's slowly going down in the West, I think, if I'm mm. not mistaken. And it can't be based on force either. Mm. Had a really, almost, almost a blazing wear, but not quite, uh, with a, a French fellow, that, um, intellectual, I'm not quite sure what he was, a uni pe person at this uh, new economy thing. He just would not believe that you can have a system like that that is not forced. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, y you've got to have a... You've got, you make peace or something like that, and you've got to have some outside force that enforces that peace. And that's not an Aboriginal way, you see. You, you've got to, it's got to come from within. And, and so on. Yeah. It's a, it, it, it is very different and unique, I always think. You know? mm -hmm. I always think in terms of like, well, all right, the whole thing about technology is a big thing. But even that's uh, very interesting if you read certain people like Bill Gamage and Bruce Pascoe, mm. you know, about how we actually technically ran the country. And so, you know, we didn't have any, you know, um, what do you call it? monumental architecture, you know, mm. great big, you know, but we did have a, I think, yeah, a monumental concept about human order. Mm. It is a monumental yeah. concept. Mm. Even, mm. even in relations between states in the West, there are, I mean, clearly different provenance and slightly different meanings, but you know, yes. the idea of an ethics of minimal, co minimal coexistence yes, and, yes. and rules so. about order yes. still yes. You know, yes. emerge yes. in the West, clearly yes. in a different yes. context yes. and so yes. forth. But you know, it's not, not entirely. Not in the Treaty of Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But it's not entirely <laughs> yes. at odds or yes, I know it's even yeah. to Westerners. That's I mean, true. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not unknown. I know. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, so, we would probably hope. That that would be built on. Yeah. <laughs> well, that would That's, be wonderful. Yeah. That would be wonderful to build on that, and especially in times like this, you know, it's really crying out for it. Eh? You know. I know we've got a couple of. Uh, if I can just add on something, I, I <laughs> it, it, <laughs> kind of right, this was invited by the idea of a discussion. <laughs> yes. But I think I take from what you're saying that you're, you're dealing with a, a different type of political ordering based in the land as being the source of source of the law. And when you uh, very subtly talked about that, building on Richard's uh, question about terms like treaty, macarata, and so on. But I think part of what you're highlighting is the importance of making credible and meaningful <coughs> progress by putting these two different forms of political ordering in conversation with each other. But I think that brings us back to Richard's original question about terminology. And I think in situations of gross asymmetry, to draw on something I was talking about before, it's very tempting for Aboriginal activists, Aboriginal people mm -hmm. to latch onto a powerful term. Yes. Sovereignty is yes. another one that's latched onto mm -hmm. by Aboriginal people. But it doesn't, but this is tricky because those powerful terms don't necessarily reflect or convey in any way the different form of yeah. political ordering that Aboriginal mm -hmm. people are, uh, are uh, mm -hmm. working with and from. And so I think then the possibility for the type of mm -hmm conversation that Mary's talking about is is very fragile and needs to be gently mm. nurtured so that if you're talking about treaties you don't allow the logic mm. of treaties yeah, right. and the 
entailments of treaty making in conventional forms to overrun the conversation. Um, so uh, I think I just wanted to make that uh, point. We have a few people. Uh, David is next on my list. Mary, thanks. Really powerful and always great to give you talk. My question was about how, how do you see the cooperation between this kind of formal, high-end, international, large-scale acti uh, activism and work and the sort of red, hot, powerful activism that's happening on the streets around Invasion Day this year. Yes, yes. When all the time media representations and politicians are working so hard to make sure that any of those, you know, red hot activists mm, mm, get mm. shut down and, and defamed. Yes. And, and yes, no, how no. do you link that respectable, very powerful international yes. activism with that? stuff that's happening on the ground and is always being used as a tool to particularly yeah. silence young Indigenous people. Yes, yes. Well, it, I don't know what to say. It, it will just continue to happen. Um, but I'm, I'm very... Um, t just to understand the... the uh, what do you call it? The, um, the thing of it, the, the detail of it, where we work with Lyndon Murphy. is in the process of writing this wonderful book, but it's, it talks about, uh, I mean, it is a, it, the idea is, you've heard of um, um, Pemelway, is it Pemelway? Pemelway, Pemelway yeah. and um, the other guy, Benelong, and that they represent two different um, ideas with Aboriginal people. <coughs> One is the resistor, you know, the resistor, the, 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 the warrior, the warrior, Geronimo Dot, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, and that's right. Um, and the other one is the, in a way, the diplomat. He talks about the peace, you know, and the getting on with each other and so on. And instead of looking at that as a, a kind of, don't look at it, he says, as a kind of a contradiction. It's not a contradiction, actually. It's quite a normal, general part of the whole kind of ordering. Do you know what I mean? You have both. You actually have both. And they're not... It's not like good cop, bad cop kind of thing, playing with each other against the enemy, you know, or whatever. Um, it's just two different ideas about about the nature of <coughs> nature, the nature of conflict, really, and they have to both be there. I put it a slightly different way between the relationalist ethos and a and a uh, survivalist ethos, and they're not in opposition. They're not either or. They actually sit beside each other. They sit beside each other and they kind of work. And sometimes it's more emphasis on this and more emphasis on that. But they sit beside each other and they work. Not necessarily like in tandem, but they're just what is required. Do you, do you know what I mean? I don't know if that's sort of... Yeah, that's it, has to be, it has to be like that. Yeah, it has thanks. to be, you know? Um, people working on treaties and people, you know, in the street. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Eloise? Thank you very much, Mary. That was absolutely fascinating, and Trudy, thank you. Um, I think I'm beginning to understand the slow movement, you know, the slow process of building up to challenge this domination, relations of domination. Mm -hmm. But to, to the question of so the, the concept of the treaty can be used in right fairly yeah, loosely yeah. in in, yeah, in, that, in that sense. Myself, yeah. but just to go back to the question that Richard asked, is there in in your vision or yours in um, Irene Watson's a vision about if you do get a treaty, the one you may want, whatever yeah, treaty yeah. is, what kind of a vision, a political vision, underpins that? To change oh, relations, to change, to change relations. the relations and, and, mm. and governance, politically speaking. Well, it, it sounds a bit sort of funny. It partly goes back to that first meeting we had when I was talking about um, melancholy, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody sort of I thought it was a bit crazy talking about it in politics, legal terms, I think. But um, probably what a lot of people would say is... Uh, the basic things like, uh, yes, it's a fair deal and we'd all get on better and, you know, people wouldn't be in dire straits anymore, hopefully. Mm. Uh, all these problems would be dealt with. Like reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation should have, um, it should be like justice of reconciliation. 
Not, not, not even necessarily truth, because the truth, the truth, the truth is the truth. You know, what is the truth? Um, and so on. <laughs> you um, work, um, work at fixing things up right now. You know, so do all that in the treaty. But the real thing about the treaty is that hopefully one big thing that we hope to get from it is that Australians will start looking after the country properly. Because that's the way people learn ethics, actually. They learn it from something outside of yourself. Don't suddenly think of it, you know, um, from a great teacher or anything like that. You actually learn it by doing. So that, that's the usefulness of, of it. It's, 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 not, it's not country or land worship and we're not captives of nature, like mm -hmm. anthropological thinking wants to say. You know, um, you're actually learning to think of think of something outside of yourself, you know? and in a, in a loop, it sort of loops back into that you're teaching yourself actually mm -hmm. how to, you know, what 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 empathy is, yeah. and what ethics are, and so on. So it's it's the long game, I suppose. It's a very long game in that sense. So you, you know and you, you practice it, but it, it doesn't become, it, it ceases to be a, an ideal, you know what I mean? An ideal of ethics or the peaceful, happy society or the good society. It ceases to be a, a set, uh, a, an ideal that you aim for and are always struggling for, or democracy or whatever. Um, you actually do the thing. That's why I do, I must say, I do admire the um, uh, China, Chinese, Chinese for when they say, and I don't know how it rolled out or what their policies were or how they did it, but lift, the idea of lifting four, 500 million people out of poverty is amazing. It would never have happened in a democratic country. <laughs> it, it can only happen in a country that's not democratic. That's true, I, I think, eh? Hey, don't you agree? Uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't I, happen, you know? You've got to follow just, up. Yeah, a yeah, quick sorry. follow up, Mary. So yes, I could say there's lots of problems yes, with the I'm example you gave about I'm China. Not, I'm not, I'm not, I'd rather go with Bill Gamage. Yes, but, yes, Bill Gamage, yeah. that's right, yeah. But and, that, and that fits for this country. Yeah. But you'd have to push something further in terms of what kind of a politics you're looking for. If you're looking at the questions that Trudy brought up or the concerns about mm. poverty. Mm. And this takes us, you know, into questions of political ideology, what kind of mm. a commitment, you know, what how mm. would we politically commit to development, quote unquote. Would it yes, be Noel yes. Pearson's logic or you yes. know, or the logic oh, of um, yes. what's the name, Marcia Langton, who would go mm. with the mining, so mm. that doesn't look after the country. Mm. But you'd have no. to talk about redistribution. So Absolutely, yeah. We'd have big rows about it mm. for a while. Yeah, yeah. Quite a while. Yeah. And, and, and but these and are questions right, relevant to any. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's right, any, any, anywhere at all. Um, one, I suppose one thing that might stand out is that I, I guess we'd probably insist on Aboriginal people, and I don't mean it in a fundamentalist way, yeah, yeah. Aboriginal people running Aboriginal affairs, mm. truly, because that's where half this money goes, actually. Yeah. It goes, and I'm sorry if this is offensive, because uh, there's some really good people working in mm. Aboriginal affairs. Um, it goes uh, billions of dollars towards uh, paying off uh, people's white fellows' mortgages, basically. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's where the a bit like aid, more generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right, you know. Um, so, so we'd see if there was still still such a thing as Aboriginal affairs, Aboriginal mm -hmm. Torres Strait Islander affairs, we'd want to run it, in, but in our way, in our terms of reference, within our framework. Mm -hmm. See, it would be, have to be run like that. So that would take a lot of negotiation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Martin, yeah. Yeah. thank thank you so much, Mary. That was splendid as always. I just had one thing when you were talking earlier about um, common law countries and this whole problem about you know, treaty and accommodation and everything. And I remember years ago, years ago we had a, you and I had a conversation about Sami mm. um, and, and Finland. Now, that's not strictly speaking a common, common, common law country, and neither are the other neighbours, but what's interesting about that case, insofar as there is something different there, and I think that's what we hooked the conversation on then, was that, in a sense, three sovereign countries, Sweden, Finland, and Norway, mm. had to do something together about this, right? Mm. And had to do it in a way that kind of acknowledged both um, you know, things about the country and, and maybe that's part of what changed it. But I was just wondering whether you had any kind of throwback to that, you know, where it, it, looking at places where people mm. kind of got on a little bit with um, mm. thinking about treaty making and with, uh, mm. with autonomy yes, um, yes. And without, you know, entering into the register of sovereignty and separatism mm. and all that sort of stuff. Just as a yes, it's just behaviour. 
yeah. isn't it? It's just yeah. agreed yes. upon agreed upon things. Plus, I think the indigenous people are not hugely overwhelming population, no. and not in threatening kind of threatening the, well the economic yeah. well-being of the, the the mainstream and yeah. so on. And where they are, are sort of I'm, I'm only guessing here, they're far out or north or whatever. You know, they're not. Yeah, no, it's an area. All that I mean, sort of stuff. The interesting thing, in a, in a sense, from, from my perspective, was that actually the three states yes. have to stop doing what three such states normally do. Right? Yes. So, in a sense, yes. they change. That's yes. kind of important. That in, that, that is, in, in that's doing something there, right? that can't just continue as by the normal scripts, yeah. in a sense. Now, that question before about where treaties have worked, mm. you know, that, that, that would be. Uh, sort of. I mean, it's yes, very, you know, there is. are problems everywhere, but that's yes, they're not yes. anywhere near as yeah. the ones in Canada. Or so they don't actually have treaties. So yeah, they do. I mean, there's oh, certainly lots of recognition in terms of you know what what's due legally to Sami yeah. people, what their rights to roam are, mm. what their claims to land is, and that goes across national borders, mm. which is quite interesting. Yes. So it had to be. That is interesting in yeah. itself, isn't it? Yeah. No, well, that's that sounds more like what we would. Probably, and we, we've had uh, people going over to meet with Samis, and Samis have come out here mm. to, to talk with us mm -hmm. and so on about how they got on. And the, uh, what really impressed everybody, though, was the fact that um, they had their own parliament. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was one of the things that we get. That's one of the things that we get. Yeah, that's, that's definitely would be a, you know, and, and it's run in that our way. Uh, mm. National Congress, I'm a part of it, even though it's been cut to pieces by, mm. by fa you know, financially by the government. Um, it was a, an attempt by Aboriginal people, it's an Aboriginal idea, but government money, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, and they set themselves up just as an incorporated body, really. Um, but they set themselves up according to trying to re reinvigorate the old system, see? Mm -hmm. So it's gender balanced mm -hmm. all the way. Um, Co-chairs of everything, male and female. Um, every different group, uh, chambers and so on, is uh, male, equal male and female, 20 men, 20 women, 20 men, 20, you know, three chambers, every different area of it, uh, ethics council that I was on, um, male and female, exactly. Um, so so that's, that's not just, um, uh, that, that, that is a political structure. That's the, that is the old political structure made modern, see? do you know what I mean? We would run it like that. We, we, that's, that's exactly how it would be done. You know? That's why I admire Finland. Mm. I think it's run by women, is it? Virtually, <laughs> isn't it? No, I think, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> In very powerful positions. But uh, it's not our, our, sister, our um, system, of course. But something like that, that would, um, if we were running our own, having a parliament, having a, you know. But it might, might be called parliament, yeah. an assembly or something like that. But th that's the other thing, though, too. It is where, you know, four or five hundred different language groups, just imagine, they're all like, Four or five hundred local governments, mm -hmm. each each one with their own <coughs> law, law laws, and of course there's not half that many now. Of course they've all you know gone or disappeared and so. Um, and of course, um, what's the word? Genesis. You know, not one genesis. There's five hundred genesis. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> so it's all it's very much the you know lateral system and so on. So then there's no boss of the whole thing, no hierarchy. And that can present as uh, intractable complexity, but in fact work is beginning to happen regionally where groups are developing forms of recognition among themselves to, and organising in regional blocks and so on. Any other questions or thoughts that people want to pursue? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Uma. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. Uh, what I remember about the, the case of recognition of uh, uh, indigenous rights uh, was in uh, Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, in which they uh, acknowledge uh, Pachamama mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, yes. and then yes. they give right to, 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 to the indigenous people to, to, as, as a guardian of nature. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, acknowledged in the constitution, but I think uh, the problem uh, in in the last two or three years is that uh, when it comes to to the regime change and yes. the the, the uh, rise of uh, uh, some kind of 
neoliberal uh, government, right. 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 Uh, right. yeah, they also faces uh, the issue of uh, land grabbing, yes. uh, which uh, involves uh, multinational corporations. Mm. In in, in in the context of of, of uh, uh, Aboriginal people in in, in Australia, mm. how, I think uh, yeah, the in, in the yes. global political economic world. Uh, the issue of land grab being investment is also yes, yes. Yeah, an important key. Yes, so, yes. how yes. was your oh, perspective God. on that? With, with great difficulty. <laughs> because, like you're saying before, some Aboriginal people want to, they, they'll go with that. There's no nothing romantic about living in terrible poverty. And, and, um, so, they have to. Mm. Um, but, how they work it out, uh, mm. and that's a difficult thing because this is, this is where you do want a kind of a general political kind of system, mm. I suppose, to back it up. Mm. But then, even when it does, it, it gets bought, bought out, or, or democracy, you know, that's why you know, blackfellas generally aren't Democrats. You know, they, we had one, one go at it, um, ATSIC, and that was a lot, first and last time, because everybody, everybody could see exactly how it works. It doesn't work for everybody at all, and you end up with anyone. <laughs> Anyone in, in power, you you know, voted in. You have the one you want. You know? <laughs> Talk <to> me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, anywhere, you know, anywhere at all, you know. But uh, but they could see that, you know, that uh, the people with those sorts of ideas, you know, let's well, let's forget all this old stuff. No, literally, some of them are saying that. Yeah? Let's forget all culture or stuff. I'll tell you who that is after. <laughs> you probably know. <laughs> but they would. They'd say, you know, we've got to be modern now and do all this other kind of thing. And they'd, they'd agree with the mining stuff, you know, very happily. You know, or tell us, yes, it's a good thing to be, aim for being middle class, you know. That's what Marcy has said, you know, somehow. Like that's a, some sort of saviour thing. Um, but, you know, so those arguments will go on. Um, and be, unfortunately, because the state, you know, is on the side of those indigenous people who want to go that way, they, you know, that's what we've got to look, got to look forward to. But we we will still aim for a, our own cultural integrity, see? You know, cultural integrity, territorial integrity. Too. We've got one last question to finish off. Perhaps just to say quickly, in the Australian, uh, Umar, in the Australian setting. The Crown has appropriated all Indigenous lands mm -hmm. and removed Indigenous peoples from most of those lands and the instruments through which Aboriginal people try to reassert rights in relation to land, the land rights legislation and then more recently and more particularly the native title regime facilitate access of mm -hmm. miners uh, and other development proponents, proponents to Aboriginal land mm -hmm. through the... Uh, <laughs> the veneer of Aboriginal rights. So the situation is, ra is rather different to some of the Latin American mm -hmm. countries, but it's very important to note even there, and you mentioned Bolivia as one of your cases. Here we have a situation where domestically Bolivia has adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into its national legislation, but the effect is in no way positive when it comes to Indigenous people asserting rights of free, prior and informed consent in relation to mining ventures. So the state finds itself doing this double, yes. double take. So there are no uh, easy answers to it, taking large instru international instruments and uh, plonking them into domestic settings. Um, it's the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy's got our last question, I think. Oh, um, yes. Mary, Auntie Mary, thank you so much. I've, I've learned so much from your presentation today. I'm really grateful for it. Um, I was fascinated by a comment you made towards the end of your presentation about that reconciliation is critical and important, mm -hmm. but what we need is justice oh, and yes, reconciliation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Small ones to finish. What, what does justice look like? <laughs> well, again, it's a, it's a joint thing, you see? Yeah. <coughs> it's a, it's, it, really, it really is a joint thing of um, people having confidence in their system. And especially political arguments always bring up the very fact that nobody has very much confidence in their own system. Do you know what I mean? They, they don't, really. And, of course, ours is mainly a... Our, our um, lack of confidence is mainly a kind of... Because it's so... You know, it's it's done like a dinner. Do you know what I mean? We're weak. We're, you know, um, we can't. The one thing that they never took into account, Aboriginal people, in this long, <laughs> long development, is the fact of a, a an aggressive 
peoples of all any kind coming in and taking over the country. Mm. So they learned about you know having a um, a system, uh, an efficient system inside the country, mm. but not for. Uh, there were there were visitors from the north, from Asia, all the time, right across the north, coming and going, coming and going with them, but never taking over. So as soon as somebody came in and stayed and took over, it was such a shock. It may may have well may as well have been Martians mm. landing. You know, it was um, took quite a while for them to realise that here are a people who don't respect. Uh, who, who, who don't act lawfully in other people's countries. You know, they don't know how to, they don't know the sense of it, you know. So, you know what I mean? Like, we'd have to, it's a, you know, it's, it's not just reconciliation, but justice has to take on a very broad view, very broad, not, not the Western legal, mm -hmm. not the Western legal idea yeah. about justice, yeah. and, you know, justice and law, justice yeah. and, you know, with melancholy. With me. <laughs> and, it, and it is, it's a sense of the tragic. You know? And I think old Europeans had it. Mm. Old Europeans, so, you know, everywhere, and old cultures everywhere had it. But settler societies, that's something they've got to relearn. They've got to learn it again. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, probably, you know, because they're all about other things. So, you know, the sense of the tragic. And uh, um, American writer, I think, uh, said that on, in an interview the other, the other week. I was listening, and I thought, that's quite right, too. A sense of the tragic. That's what um, you know. A deep, you know, not tearful and all that, but very deep, very soulfully deep. You know? Well, this is probably a good point at which to end today's discussion, as we point to em emotions and questions about how emotions link with political order and reconciliation and justice and so on. And there are plenty of people in the school who work on these things. Perhaps that's a uh, topic for a future conversation. It's certainly one I'd like to take up with you. But speaking of conversations and the discussion today, there's been a few times when people have talked about the need to change the types of conversation or avoid following the, the normal scripts. And I think in terms of the seminar series, we've done that to a certain extent today by beginning the seminar series in a different way, by having Mary give us her observations. So I'm very hopeful that in the school we can continue these type of conversations. Some of you may have noticed in the, in the foyer, there's a banner uh, in the foyer as you come directly outside of the lifts. And uh, this is not everything, it's a very small thing in fact, but it's an indication of the type of work and conversations that we hope we can continue to have in the school about Indigenous politics. And for some, I know there are some of you in the room who are new master's students with you with us there's a, a new course it ran for the last for the first time last year on indigenous politics which runs in semester two this year it's taught by my colleague Liz Strakosh so we're in various ways trying to continue these conversations in the school um, but I hope you'll agree that today has been an important part of that and join me in thanking Mary <laughs>